Greetings, everyone. On behalf of Dr. Helen Cross and myself, we would like to welcome you to the first ILAE named lecture, the Fred Anderman Lecture on Clinical Epileptology. This is, of course, in honor of Fred Anderman, who meets really uh, no explanation. He had an incredible role as a mentor, a teacher. He has academic children and grandchildren really all over the world as an incredible and astute clinician, as a researcher, uh, really, and as someone who changed the way we think about epilepsy in many ways. I would like to thank especially uh, the people who spearheaded the creation of this uh, lecture, which is an endowed lecture. Um, in particular, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Jean Godman, who is our ILAE liaison for this uh, activity and for uh, the tremendous work that he and other people, the Fred Anderman family, uh, have done to create uh, this lecture. Um, uh, the first uh, order of the day will be uh, for Dr. Francois Dubot to say a few words about Fred. Francois uh, is, of course, a close friend and also um, an academic child of Dr. Fred Anderman. So I invite you to listen to uh, Dr. Francois Dubot. Dear Professor Cross and Professor Wiebe, I would like to thank you and the members of the ILE Executive Committee for giving me this unique opportunity to speak about Frederick Anderman. I would also like to thank all of you who, by their confidence, writing, and elegies, helped me in achieving this, res this responsibility, and in particular, Marilyn Jones Gottman, Samuel Berkovic, and Jean Gottman. Frederick Anderman, distinguished Canadian neurologist and epileptologist, passed away in Montreal on June 16, 2019, at the age of 88. Several tributes have been written about this remarkable physician. I have today the immense privilege to briefly speak of him and to introduce the newly created ILAE Frederick Anderman Lecture in Clinical Epileptology. Frederick Anderman trained in medicine at the University of Montreal and then in neurology at McGill University. He worked at the Montreal Neurological Institute and at the Montreal Children's Hospital throughout his entire professional life and rose to professor and professor emeritus. His influence was considerable. He was the recipient of many prestigious and distinguished awards, and his work and legacy is well recognized in his country and across the world. Fred Anderman became rapidly known in his career as a gifted epileptologist. He was an extraordinary clinician who always returned to the clinical history and with a remarkable empathy for patients of all backgrounds. He had an exceptional clinical eye for things that were special and an outstanding memory for patients and their clinical symptoms. His ability to process disparate clinical patterns simultaneously, to pull out common themes and to put seemingly unconnected clinical features together from multiple patients allow them to discover or refine the clinical features of many disorders. Let's listen to Fred for a brief moment. One of the major research area we worked on was a novel genetic syndrome which we named familial agenesis of the corpus callosum with sensory motor neuronopathy. This was something. It had not been recognized as a specific syndrome, people assuming these patients either had muscular dystrophy or cerebral palsy. In the late 60s, I saw two boys who had moderate intellectual handicap and areflexia, as well as distal paralysis and scoliosis coupled with some other unusual features. The family came from the Charlevoix Sagne region. One year later, I saw two brothers originating from the same region with very similar clinical features. At the Shriner Hospital, where I was consultant, there was a little girl, seven years old, that looked very much like those other boys. When I went to look at her, I said to my colleague, I think she probably has a genesis of the corpus callosum. The people look at me, how do you know that? She hadn't had any tests yet. Fred Enderman demonstrated this extraordinary ability to propose the right diagnosis or a default to open original exploration routes that eventually would shed lights on problems seen until then as obscure or without apparent solution. He contributed to the understanding of the nature and physiopathology of several neurological and epileptic disorder, migraine and epilepsy, malformation of cortical developmental disorder, Rasmussen syndrome, hypothalamic hematoma, progressive myoclinic epilepsies, to name a few. He was a strong advocate for surgical treatment of drug-resistant epilepsy, and in the 70s and 80s, he did a lot to change misperception that epilepsy surgery was a last resource treatment avenue. 
He was highly interested in the application of sophisticated technologies to surgical treatment of epilepsy. Although he was not an imaging or data scientist, his intuitive ability to see the clinical relevance and place of these investigations, and more importantly, where they were not relevant, was quite remarkable to watch. Fred Anderman collaborated with many people. He had an extraordinary ability to convince colleagues to put their ideas together and work on a common problem. And also this extraordinary ability to motivate students and fellows to think and jump into new perspectives. He worked during his close to 60 years of career with many and often remarkable collaborators linked to the clinical and scientific community. Fred Anderman was a gift for, has a gift for teaching. Enthusiastic teacher, full of ideas, and generous of his time, he had a stream of students and fellows from all continents. One forum of his teaching was the weekly seizure conference. This was a forum to review complex epilepsy cases, and everyone had to attend this mass, conducted by Fred with Maestra. The clinical presentation had to be detailed, given by resident or junior fellows, and then everyone who had worked with the patient presented their results. With great intelligence, he was bridging clinic with science and able to put together fundamental neurological questions with difficult clinical decision. He was teaching us the heart of reflection and discussion. We had, during the seizure conference, each in turn to formulate an opinion, a reasoned proposal on one or the other of these difficult cases. He was always doing so with skill and finesse and with the idea that diving into the arena would help us to refine our reasoning. Another constant element in his training was related to literature. In Fred's view, dissemination of knowledge was a necessity. He pushed us, the student and the fellows, to search the literature and always insisted that we write up our interesting findings. Frederick Anderman was a one in a generation clinician scientist, care provider, and teacher. The decision of the ILE to name a lecture for him is most appropriate. It is for the man as a tribute to his clinical brilliance and humanism, and it is also for clinical epileptology. At the time of high-tech and artificial intelligence, clinical mastery remains irreplaceable. And Friedrich Handerman was a master in this field and a remarkable and authoritative representative of the clinical diagnosis approach. Thank you. So it gives me great pleasure to not only thank Francois for that citation, but now to introduce our first ILE Fred Anderman lecturer, Professor Simon Chauvin. Simon has been professor and consultant in neurology at uh, University College London and the National Hospital for Neuro Neurology and Neurosurgery, Queen Square in London over the past four decades where in conjunction with the Epilepsy Society, as it now is the charity, he developed one of the most active epilepsy groups in Europe. With the research developed, he has made significant contributions in many areas of clinical epilepsy, not least in therapy, epidemiology, imaging and status epilepticus, as well as to the history of epilepsy and of course, the International League Against Epilepsy. He was Epilepsia co-editor-in-chief for 10 years. He has also been responsible for the training of many epileptologists worldwide, and it's an honor for me to count myself amongst them. There appears to be no better um, person as in, it, uh, as in reflection of what Fred Anderman stood for to give this first lecturer, lecture in clinical epileptology. And so I call upon Simon to deliver his lecture. At the end, there will be time for questions and answers. So please put your questions in the chat and we will moderate the session. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm deeply honored to have been asked to give the Landerman lecture. and would like to offer my sincere thanks to the ILAE for their kind um, invitation. Uh, this is the title of my talk, but before addressing this, I would like to add a few personal reminiscences um, uh, about Fred Anderman. 
here is Fred and Eva uh, uh, and his family. There can be few who doubt that Fred Anderman was one of the towering giants of 20th century epilepsy. He had an extraordinary and encyclopedic knowledge. Uh, he, he carried out research of great importance and he was an educator par excellence. There are a few indeed who could hold a candle to his myriad landmark achievements. But above all this, he was at heart also an amazing human being. He was loved by everybody, he was friends with everyone, and he conferred joy and happiness on all he met. I'm going to give a historical lecture today and start with Healings Jackson. And this is deliberate for Fred not only had a, a deep and uh, detailed grasp of neurology and epilepsy, but he also had a great interest in history. Here is a picture uh, which I really enjoy, for it shows uh, three great men of uh, neurology, all together at Queen Square in 1996, Fred Anderman, David Marsden and Hugh Links Jackson. The occasion is an interesting story. Uh, there was a famous bust of Hewlings Jackson at Queen Square, which was copied and presented to the Montreal Neurological Institute <coughs> at its foundation. Then in the 1990s, the original bust at Queen Square mysteriously disappeared. Staff were mortified as Jackson was the hospital's superstar. Fred got to hear of this and at his own initiative, and I think also at his own cost, he arranged to have a facsimile copy made of the Montreal copy, uh, which he then personally brought back to London. <clears throat> Here is uh, Fred, uh, David Marsden, the then Dean, and Hewlings Jackson. It was a joyous day for the hospital and was followed by a party and joint London Montreal scientific meeting and Fred's kind and generous gesture uh, will never be forgotten. He was always a great personal friend and mentor to me and my family uh, and I spent many happy hours visiting Eva and Fred in Montreal and enjoying their legendary hospitality. <clears throat> he has trained a whole cohort of specialists in the science of epilepsy and also in the art of being a good doctor. There are many thousands around the world whose lives were touched by Fred and the world is a poorer place now that he's not with us. And so now to the topic of my talk, the changing conception of epilepsy in the last 150 years. <clears throat> At first sight, it may seem surprising that the concept of epilepsy would change over time. The physical manifestations have not altered at all. They are the same now in 2021 as they were in 1900 or 1870 or indeed in 400 BC when Hippocrates wrote the first tract on epilepsy. However, the concept of epilepsy, i.e. what it signifies and what it means, has been utterly transformed. There have been radical changes uh, in the concept over the whole course of the 20th century and epilepsy in 2021 would be completely unrecognizable to any citizen doctor uh, or uh, scientist in earlier decades and uh, this is the topic of my talk. So here's an overview of what I'm going to say. First, I'm going to give a short preamble uh, on two topics. The first, what is a disease? And the second, on the importance of perspective. Then I'll discuss how the concept of epilepsy has changed over the last 150 years. One can artificially divide this period into two or three distinct eras. First is the era 1870 to 1940, which I've called the psycho-hereditarian era. And this was a time when the condition was very stigmatized 
and often hidden. The watershed was the Second World War, and between the 1940s and 1990s, her uh, uh, epilepsy changed completely, and this one might call the neurological era. And then as we move to the present day, things are changing again, and this I've called the molecular era. Amongst others, there are four interrelated aspects which are relevant when considering the concept of epilepsy over this time, and I will focus on these. The first is whether epilepsy is a disease or simply a symptom. <clears throat> the second is whether epilepsy is a mental disease. The third is whether epilepsy is an illness confined only to the occurrence of seizures, or whether there are also other inherent psychiatric or behavioral features. And the fourth is the extent to which epilepsy is considered to be an inherited disorder. The pendulum on each of these topics has swung violently over the course of the century. Finally, I'll end with two thoughts about this history. First, I'll muse on the circularity of history and the dangers this holds. And second, I'll consider whether epilepsy really exists as a disease at all. So let's start with, my, with the preamble and my first point. And this is, um, this is the question of what constitutes a disease. From the medical perspective, until the 17th century, a symptom was the disease. Uh, for instance, fever, um, skin rash, a convulsion. These were diseases. Then in the 17th century, Thomas Sydenham uh, is credited as the first person who, who redefined a disease as a characteristic constellation of symptoms and signs. Then in the 18th and 19th century, this constellation of symptoms and signs was linked to the finding of pathological causes. And then in the 19th and 20th century, pathogenesis and cause became central to the concept of disease with the rise, for instance, of histology, biochemistry and molecular genetics. And now, the criteria for accepting an entity as a disease, at least in the medical sense, are threefold. A characteristic constellation of symptoms and signs, a characteristic pathogenesis, and a characteristic cause. The second point in my preamble um, is the question of perspective. Throughout the 20th century, epilepsy has been influenced not only by medicine, but also by science, society, and personal experience. And epilepsy is like a ship buffeted by these currents, and these have altogether directed its cause, its course. Uh, from each of these perspectives, the concept of epilepsy will look very different. To science, for instance, epilepsy is a molecular and physiological condition. To society, epilepsy is perceived in economic or legislative terms and in terms of cultural or political attitude. To patients, it is the fact of being epileptic with its effect on such aspects as social interactions, domestic life, uh, education and employment, which is important. The concept of epilepsy is indeed an amalgam of all these influences. As Temkin, who wrote the definitive history on epilepsy, uh, saw it, epilepsy is the paradigm of the suffering of both body and soul in disease. Um, and uh, few uh, can disagree with this comment. After this preamble, I will now return to the main point of this talk, and that is to show how the concept of epilepsy 
what it signifies and means to medicine and to the public has changed. I'll start with the era 1870s to 1940s and, and spend most time on this period as, is, as it's then that the concept of epilepsy was most different from that of today. As I said earlier, this was a time when what epilepsy meant would be quite unrecognizable to us today. Back to Hewlings Jackson. The modern history in epilepsy can be said to have dated from him. Before him, epilepsy was still widely thought to, um, to be a reflex in the medulla or caused even by demonic, demonic, uh, demonic possession. It's with amazing insight that he defined an epileptic seizure as the name for an occasional excessive rapid and local discharge of gray matter. And this idea has remained unchanged ever since. He considered epilepsy to be a defect at cellular level, turning, a cell, uh, turning cells into unstable bastard cells, as he called them. In other words, to Jackson, uh, epilepsy and seizures uh, were essentially interchangeable concepts. Whilst we still adhere largely to his definition of a seizure, the idea of what constituted epilepsy, though, began radically to change, and it did so with the rise of psychiatry uh, and heredity. In 1907, Aldrin Turner, uh, in his landmark book, Epilepsy, the Idiopathic Condition, defined epilepsy as follows. Epilepsy is a chronic progressive disease of the brain characterized by periodic occurrence of seizures and frequently accompanied by psychical phenomena occurring generally in persons with a hereditary neuropathic history which shows itself in the signs and stigmata of degeneration. Um, it, um, to Turner and to most others of the time, idiopathic epilepsy was considered to be the only genuine form of epilepsy and seizures due to tumor and trauma, et cetera, were considered simply to be symptoms of the underlying condition. So to Turner and, uh, and others, epilepsy now was a disease, not a symptom. It was inherited as part of the neuropathic trait, and it was a degenerative mental disorder with inherent personality and psychiatric disturbances. The neuropathic trait uh, is an interesting um, concept. According to this hypothesis, uh, it, uh, various neurological and psychiatric disorders, including personality traits, were, were inherited together as part of the same defect, a germ plasm defect, and epilepsy was at its center. Included in the tray uh, were uh, medical disorders such as insanity and madness and career, but also behavioral disorders such as criminality, amorality, pauperism. The tray was considered to be due to defective germplasm. Uh, of course, at the time, genes were not identified. And the basis of the trait was degeneration. Now, degeneration was a dominant medical and sociological theory of the time, which was used to explain a wide variety uh, of medical and social phenomena. In families inheriting uh, the tray, uh, there would be a progressive deterioration over generations. For instance, uh, with varying um, medical uh, uh, manifestations. For instance, uh, in one generation, there may be hysteria or migraine, or there may be family members with epilepsy. And then the next generation, this may lead to intemperance or insanity. 
uh, this theory was abandoned uh, only in the 1920s and until that time was almost universally held, accepted uh, by psychiatrists and neurologists. Another element of the concept of epilepsy uh, at the time related to the epileptic personality. It was unanimously believed that people with epilepsy had a typical personality structure as part of this degenerative process. For instance, this is what Turner wrote. He used, he said it was rare to find epileptics who did not present some form of mental obliquity. And he used such terms um, as uh, self-opinionated, egotistical, religious, but whose actions are often perverted, passionate and immoral. Ideas of right and wrong are often vague, uh, habitual irritability, violence, feeble judgment, etc. And a similarly unflattering picture of the personality of people with epilepsy appeared in all medical, sociological, and legislative accounts of the time. The next dominant theory of epilepsy to arise came from psychiatry, and this was psychoanalysis. This too was extremely stigmatizing and damaging to people with epilepsy. According to leading analysts, seizures were due to abnormal psychological mechanisms, notably infantile regression. Ferenczi, for instance, as shown here in this picture as a member of Freud's inner circle, wrote that seizures are a regression to an extremely primitive level of organization in which all inner excitations are discharged by the shortest motor pathway. <clears throat> uh, many neurologists accepted the theory and the distinguished American neurologist Piers Clark, who was president of the National Association for the Study of Epilepsy, defined a seizure as a striving for expression of the libidinous energies in the unconscious. The fit is therefore a libidinous outlet of the primal sexual energy. To Piers Clark and to, every, and to uh, Ferenczi and other analysts, a seizure was basically a pathological uh, dysfunction of the unconscious. The psychoanalysts also focused on the epileptic personality, attributing long lists of negative features uh, to be the result of infantile regression. Clark, for instance, wrote that persons with epilepsy exhibited extreme hypersensitivity and egotism, violence and anger, lack of good fellowship, aloofness, emotional and sexual um, underdevelopment, violence, and um, attributed all these uh, to infantile regression. And it was against this background that the person with epilepsy uh, had to struggle. The concept of inheritance of epilepsy moved forward with the classic paper of Davenport and Weeks in 1911. This was a 30 page paper showing the results of the analysis of inheritance uh, in 177 families and was highly influential. He concluded that epilepsy was inherited um, as a recessive disorder as part of the neurological trait. And in the families of patients, um, he looked for other manifestations of the trait, including alcoholism, migraine, chorea, paralysis, neurosis, uh, and so on. His attitude and venom towards these families can be seen from the caption. And I read just the bits and bobs from them. Empty germplasm yields only emptiness. Mother and daughter, when not in the county jail, live in a cellar in the town. The father belongs to a strain that shows insanity. The girls are immoral. The boys are implicated in local robberies. Davenport concluded from his study 
that if patients with epilepsy are, are allowed to reproduce, the number of epileptics would double every 30 years. As he wrote, it's perfectly clear that no epileptic person, person should ever be allowed to marry or become a parent. To the patient, these, these views on heredity, on the neuropathic tray, on degeneration, and on the epileptic personality were a very toxic mix, and the disease engendered huge stigma and hostility in society. In response, patients and their families largely kept their condition hidden. In literature too, epilepsy was usually depicted as a form of madness, and to the public at large, epilepsy and lunacy were interchangeable words. As a consequence of these medical ideas and theories of uh, the psychology and uh, heredity, uh, this led to eugenics. This became a predominant social force in many countries for 30 years between 1915 and 1945, and medical doctors took a lead role in promoting it. It led to highly prejudicial legislation and to social actions against those with epilepsy. In America and, Germ and Germany, for instance, in 1907, uh, the first compulsory sterilization on the basis of epilepsy was in, it was in Indiana. And by 1923, there were laws in 23 American states by 1945, over 65,000 compulsory sterilizations, uh, sterilizations were carried out. These were a solution to Davenport's problem of the rising tide of epileptics, as he put it. Uh, he initially tried to introduce strict male-female segregation in asylums to limit reproduction, but soon realized this wouldn't be effective. And it was on this basis that sterilization was then proposed and a huge public campaign launched by Davenport and the eugenicists and public opinion swung heavily in its favor. In Nazi Germany too there was a strong medical eugenics movement which was incorporated into the racial hygiene program. Propaganda claimed that they are handicapped and epileptics were unproductive and an economic burden on society, and posters can be uh, shown at the bottom there. People with hereditary epilepsy were then first subjected to involuntary sterilization, as in America, and then in the 1930s, uh, uh, by the Nazi regime, were sent to gas chambers in the infamous Action T4 campaign. It's estimated that between two and 300,000 disabled people were thus murdered, including many with epilepsy. Doctors collaborated with these measures uh, by notifying patients to the so-called hereditary courts. By the end of the 1930s, therefore, the concept of epilepsy as a mental disease laden with the baggage of personality defect and inheritance uh, resulted in profound stigma and the rights of people with epilepsy uh, were widely abused. The watershed was the Second World War and after the war with the rise of science and, and in the era of new social democratic political thought, attitudes to epilepsy and the conception of epilepsy began to change. Let's start with social attitudes. In 1945 and 1946, the Nuremberg trials um, brought to light uh, the eugenic disposal of epileptic patients um, in Germany, and eugenics was thereafter outlawed as a science. And uh, the and uh, in parallel, the interest in the genetics of epilepsy which had been intense before the war, uh, had now largely completely ceased. Uh, in 1948, 
the UN Declaration of Human Rights was an important document. Uh, and in the 1960s, this led to the rise to the extension of the rights to those with disabilities and to the disability rights movement. In the 1950s and 1960s, uh, there was a strong social pressure also to end confinement in asylums. And in the 1960s, uh, an anti-psychiatry movement arose, which queried indeed whether mental illness actually existed uh, and whether it was, it was society and not the individual patient uh, who was sick. From 1949 to 1979, the AES uh, commissioned public attitude surveys, um, and these showed continuing improvement in the attitudes towards epilepsy. And in 1961, the International Bureau of Epilepsy was founded, uh, and people with epilepsy at last um, had their own voice. Discriminatory and exclusional legislation were removed uh, in almost all Western countries by the 1990s. Uh, and this, uh, the, this process of changing social attitudes uh, culminated, in my view, in the global campaign against epilepsy, which was launched by the ILAE and the WHO in the 1990s. Uh, and uh, which aimed to abolish stigma. And this, I think, demonstrated the extent to which the societal position of those with epilepsy uh, had changed and had improved. But it wasn't only in society, it was also in medicine uh, that changes began to occur. And one reason for this was the development of neurology and its differentiation from psychiatry. And by the 1940s, neurology and psychiatry had moved far apart. Kinnear Wilson was a leading European epilepsy specialist of the time. And in his classic work, his three volume textbook uh, on neurology, he discussed the nature and conception of epilepsy. He was one of the first to dismiss the idea that only idiopathic epilepsy was genuine epilepsy. As medicine had advanced, a number of underlying causes of seizures had been uncovered, and he saw no reason for not including these within the rubric of epilepsy. He also dismissed the idea that epilepsy was inherited, and he calls, called this persistently overrated. He was also one of the first to dismiss the idea that there were in people with epilepsy inherent personality defects. As he said in his outpatient clinics, there were many people with epilepsy uh, who had entirely normal personalities. To Wilson, epilepsy was composed only of seizures, and given the large number of causes, he deliberately entitled his chapter on epilepsy in his textbook, The Epilepsies, he rejected the idea that epilepsy was a distinct disease and indeed wondered whether it would be better to drop the term epilepsies altogether and replace this by paroxysmal disorders. In 1941, uh, the senior American epileptologist William Cobb identified 60 causes for, for epilepsy and stated that because of the great many different forms of interference with nervous integration that can lead to the production of fits. And because of the interfering factors are so varied and even paradoxical, I believe that epilepsy cannot be called a disease. It is a symptom of many cerebral diseases. It was then the introduction of EEG in the late 30s, which created the new medical paradigm. This was the era when epilepsy became again conceptualized mainly in terms of physiology. And actually this was a return to the Jacksonian concept. As Lennox put it in 1937, an epileptic seizure was a paroxysmal cerebral dysrhythmia. 
uh, to Lennox, it was a clear vindication of Jackson's concept of seizures and EEG seemed to be a visualization of this discharge. This idea that epilepsy was a cerebral uh, dysrhythmia um, culminated in the 1969 classification of epileptic seizures, which, which were defined almost entirely in electroclinical terms. Gaston defined uh, uh, epilepsy for the ILAE as a chronic brain disorder characterized by recurrent seizures due to excessive discharge of cerebral neurons. The focus was now on seizures as a physiological event and the definition of epilepsy had no mention of heredity of personality or behavioral features or indeed of etiology. In the 1980s the concept of the epileptic syndrome arose which was defined as a specific constellation of symptom signs and EEG features but unlike a disease it was without a fixed uh, etiology. Then in the 1980s with the advent of MRI the concept of epilepsy as being a disorder of physiology and function was somewhat rebalanced to epilepsy being seen also as a disorder of structure and uh, with MRI began a new interest in the etiological basis of epilepsy in the pathological and pathogenic causes of epilepsy and this also stimulated the development of epilepsy surgery. And this brings us to the modern era. So let's start with the patient's perspective. One of the most striking changes over the whole century is that the condition was now emerging out of the shadows. The voice of people with epilepsy was now being fully heard, perhaps for the first time in history. One sign of this was the fact that people were able openly and frankly to write about their condition. And from the 1990s onwards, numerous such books have been published. And here is a selection. Similarly, epilepsy appeared in many films. Social media too in the last 10 years has given epilepsy a new and easy platform. Uh, this changing position of those with epilepsy in society has resulted in much greater self-esteem. And although stigma continues to exist, it is at a much lower level than in the past. In science too, there's been a rapid uh, development um, in the understanding of epilepsy and a whole range of molecular and cellular physiological and chemical uh, events and changes and mechanisms have been identified. Uh, and here is a list from Phil Schwarzkroen um, giving uh, a sort of idea of the uh, range of pathogenic uh, um, mechanisms. From the perspective of medicine too, epilepsy is also changing and rather remarkably returning to a concept similar in many ways to that of 1900 which is where we started. Uh, there is a striking circularity in three particular aspects. First is the increasing interest in the psychiatric comorbidities. Epilepsy is again being conceived as a disorder with inherent and inherited behavioral and psych psychiatric associations in addition to seizures. And this is in some ways a modern reworking of the concept of the neurological tray. This change was reflected in the ILA definition of epilepsy, uh, newly formed in 2005, as a disease characterized by an enduring predisposition to generate epileptic seizures. That, of course, is very similar to Gasto's, but, but it continues, and by the neurobiological, cognitive, psychological, and social consequences of this condition. 
and this, this brings a definition rather similar to Turner's in 1907. The second change um, is the fact that neurology and psychiatry are growing closer together, united under the barrier, under the banner of neuroscience. The distinction between the two is becoming increasingly blurred. And this too carries the risk that epilepsy might again acquire the label of a mental disorder. Third, and perhaps most important of all, is the renewal of interest in the genetic basis of epilepsy. The new genetics, as it became known, first surfaced in, epile in clinical epilepsy in the mid 1990s. And since then, there's been an increasing tendency to consider ep to epilepsy again as a genetic disorder. By 2016, over 700 genes have been discovered uh, uh, with epilepsy, in, um, uh, uh, which included epilepsy in their phenotype. There has been a wholesale switch of the research agenda to genetics and to gene hunting and billions of dollars have been expended. But is calling epilepsy a genetic disorder really justified? Although there are numerous monogenic conditions with epilepsy in their phenotype, individually these conditions are extremely rare and all in all account for probably less than 5% of all persons with epilepsy. Of the many uh, variants associated with epilepsy, uh, most have very small effect. Uh, and these genetic variants have sometimes been called maggots, uh, the so-called many associated genes of tiny significance. Similar findings have been found in other brain disorders, including schizophrenia and uh, bipolar disease. In this sense, idiopathic epilepsy is best considered in the same way as height, intelligence and weight um, or other human characteristics. Labeling these as genetics renders the term, in my opinion, rather meaningless. There may be multiple genes involved, but these interact with environment, with nutrition, with developmental factors. And if we call these genetics, then the, then the term becomes meaningless. The ILA, has suggested, the ILA has suggested a change in the name of IGE to GGE. And in my view, this too is regrettable. And I would suggest that the, ter that the term genetic when applied to epilepsy is restricted to cases in which there is a strong genetic influence. Does calling epilepsy a genetic disease really matter? Well, I think it may do so. Uh, genetic endowment is a uniquely sensitive issue. It's often viewed as the essence of a person and genetic findings have the potential to assign individuals to minority groupings or underclasses, and this can lead to social exclusion or worse. In many cultures, labeling a condition genetic already acts as a barrier to marriage or to having children, and genetic differences bring in their wake uh, eugenic solutions. And there are many examples of eugenic solutions already being already applied in medicine. This brings me to my final point, <clears throat> and that is the question as whether it's now sensible to use the term epilepsy at all. It's clear from the medical point of view that epilepsy is not strictly speaking a disease, with its very variable symptoms, clinical con contexts, pathogenesis and, and causes. It doesn't conform at all to the three criteria uh, used for defining an entity as a disease, at least in the medical model. <clears throat>
It's a blanket term covering hundreds of different disorders in which seizures occurred. It is equivalent in this sense to headache or anemia, and no one would call these diseases. The reason though that the term is retained is not medical at all. From the societal and personal perspectives, it is a term which has utility as a shorthand uh, for people uh, being liable for people who are liable to epileptic seizures. As such, it's included in employment contracts, in legal proceedings, and in economic and political decision making, for instance. It's a linguistic sleight of hand, though, which has changed epileptic seizures into epilepsy. And it is the retaining of this label that is the cause of much stigma and social disadvantage. In the 1970s, changing the term epileptic to people with epilepsy or uh, PWE only partly helped. Uh, the emphasis on the individual and not on the condition was of course welcome, but this, this change also confirms the existence of the disease. Um, in China and Korea too, the word epilepsy has been changed precisely because of its linguistic associations with lunacy. If we are to destigmatize the condition, perhaps med medicine should take the initiative and make it clear that epilepsy is not a disease. The abolition of the term epilepsy from medicine could be a first step in out outlawing it in, uh, in societal settings. The counter argument, of course, is that these are just linguistic games and that even if not a disease, there needs to be a term covering the concept of a person being liable to epileptic seizures. And there is some sense in this, but accuracy in words matter. Many stigmatizing phrases have been removed from usage and are now outlawed. Uh, in general, their removal has improved the lives of people so labeled. I hesitate even to say these words in public, uh, but for instance, in the field of learning disability, the outlawing of the words mental defective, mentally handicapped, moron, spastic, idiot, etc., and in psychiatry, the outlawing of the words lunatic and madman uh, have helped people uh, who had previously been so labeled. And I wonder if the same might be said for epilepsy. Should the term epilepsy be removed from the lexicon of medicine? Perhaps this is a point worth debating. And with that, um, I'm, I stop and would like to thank the ILA again for allowing me to give the Anderman lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, a real tour de force of history and Whenever I hear you speak about that, I always learn a huge amount. So um, thank you for that. And it's been quite a, an interesting path, I suppose, as to where we've got to today. And in some instances, perhaps coming full circle, as you've explained. Can I encourage people to um, put questions in um, the question and answer? There are a couple of questions. Um, perhaps um, the first is, um, uh, it comes from somebody you'd recognise, um, Bridget McDonald, I'm going to say her name because I know that you'd uh, uh, be aware. And she asks that um, about the epileptic personality and how those who are unfoundedly opinionated drove medically justified evil helps people now to avoid the problem of confirmation bias. Or do you find that many still are very unsure they are still are very sure they are right about aspects of healthcare without justification. How does it impact on epileptology? Well, um, thank you, Bridget, for the question. Um, I think uh, the reason these theories arose was probably because the only people who uh, sort of willingly declared themselves to have epilepsy were those in asylums. The 
people in the street on the whole kept very quiet. And I think we shouldn't forget that many, many people in the 1900s had no access to medical treatment at all. So what doctors saw were the people in the asylums who may have had all sorts of comorbidities of which epileptic seizures were just one. Um, and they met many of them, most of them really, well, also had some sort of intellectual disability. So that's how I think the concept arose. Um, whether uh, there's any justification in it, the answer is no. And I think that's absolutely shown by, as it were, personal um, uh, uh, population statistics and population mm -hmm. studies. Um, although there are individuals who have certain traits, but there are also individuals without epilepsy who have the same traits. So I, I think we should be very strong and uh, about about this question. And if there even are, and if there are certain characteristics in certain groups, then uh, you know that's not a medical issue. Thank you. And the, the next question, I think, probably follows on something that I was going to 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 raise, really. And and um, I mean, the straight question is: if we don't have epilepsy, what term do we propose? And and I acknowledge there's there's a lot of difficulty with translation of the term um, around the world into different languages. But this term has been around. I mean, we look at other fields where where names have been retired, but this is a term that's been utilised over a, historically, as you pointed out, a very, very long period of time. So is it something that we should look to ch change? You know, what could, I mean, what could replace it? Or is it something that we still have to work at trying to um, change the view of? And yeah. also, if, it, if it's not a disease, then what is it? Right, okay. Um, <laughs> I was going to come to that in a minute. <laughs> so, um, I think the second question is easier than the first. So it's not a disease, what is it? It's a whole constellation of different diseases. Some of them are genetic, some are not genetic, some are developmental. I think we grossly underestimate the importance of development. And you know, when you find genes, there might be some association with a gene, small association. It's not really matter. What matters is when that gene is switched on and off. And that happens over time. And epilepsy is a developmental disease par excellence. It is time related. Um, so it's a collection of, of different diseases. And I think that should be emphasized to um, when people say, well, epilepsy is X. Epilepsy isn't an is. Epilepsy is an R, if you like. I mean, it's hundreds of different things. Um, as for what might replace it, it's a very, uh, because, it's, because it's lumbered with so much baggage, um, I think it should be replaced in a way, because I think even simply replacing the name, as the Chinese and the Koreans have uh, ascertained, I mean, they've realized that the word carries with it uh, implications, you know, in people's in the back of people's mind. Well, I think epilepsy does too. So um, it should be changed. And what it's changed to is a different matter. I think you could either talk about the constellation of different disorders, or you could talk about people who have seizures. Uh, um, but I, I do wonder whether the name, the, the word should be removed. We've removed other words from the lexicon. We've removed mental defective, for instance. Thank goodness. We've removed, uh, you know, the, the classic 1930s characterization as a moron or an idiot. We got rid of those. And um, I think the, at least the debate should be held about whether the advantages of having what is essentially a shorthand term, whether those advantages are over are greater than the advantages of, the, uh, of losing the term altogether. There is there is a comment to ask whether it would be better to call, call it a disorder rather than a disease. 
and I remember, I mean, this is a debate that's gone backwards and forwards and maybe it'd be reopened again, but I remember we, we, there was a lot of discussion around the centenary, I think, when we were thinking about the definition and even discussion with patients when there was a sort of a strong bias towards disease because they felt that was easier to deal with, but mm -hmm. it, doesn't ref it doesn't reflect the rest of the connotations. Yeah. So um, the ILA definition did change from disorder to disease, uh, rather interestingly. And I, I did ask Pete Engel why that was. And he told me that, this is not a particularly good reason, I must say, but he told me that the pharmaceutical industry told the um, people that raising money for a disorder is much less easy than raising money for a disease. And that as people were trying to raise money for epilepsy, then you know you might as well call it a disease. And I, th I think that there is something in that. And what's the difference between disorder and disease? In my opinion, there's no medical difference and there's no scientific difference really. Um, but in society, the word disorder to an average person in the street, the word disorder carries less uh, kind of fear than the word disease. So if you're going to get, if you're going to make some change, call it disorder. I think the actual word probably should be changed. You, you know, if I could add briefly, uh, Simon, yes, uh, some of this debate actually still occurred when I first joined the ILE executive back, you know, when Nico was president and it was, uh, it, it appeared to be easier to get the attention of funding agencies, inclusive, you know, non-pharmaceutical funding agencies, if you focused on a disease rather than a, something that was vaguer or less, less concrete than a disease or less serious than a disease, right? And then, but you know, we routinely ask our patients uh, whether they think they have epilepsy or a seizure disorder and that much rather have a seizure disorder than epilepsy, Every, almost uh, invariably, yeah. That's interesting, yeah. Okay, so I'm very conscious that we just have a minute left. And therefore, I think we need to say a huge thank you to um, Simon for um, the fantastic lecture. I apologize we've not been able to answer all the questions. Um, this debate, I'm sure, with other things could go on for a while. I also want to thank, obviously, all the colleagues and um, uh, ex-fellows of FRED all we you know we remember him with huge um, aff affinity and the fact that he made such an enormous contribution for establishing this legacy. Thank you to Francois for the lovely introduction and I don't know whether Sam you want to say a final point. Thank you very much Helen. Nothing other than to reiterate a uh, brilliant lecture so uh, erudite uh, as always Simon. Thank you so much for being such a you know worthy inaugural uh, uh, lecturer for the Fred Anderman cl uh, Clinical Epileptology Lecture. Thank you again to all those who worked so hard at organizing, and uh, thank you to all those who attended uh, to this lecture. And we look forward to the future Fred Anderman lectures in clinical epileptology. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.